Several years ago, nobody, I think, would have known what you meant if you said tsunami. But nature has given us the opportunity to see what a devastating effect such mass movements of water can have on coastal communities, on very high-tech infrastructure. How does a tsunami occur? What happens? I think we all know there's something to do with earthquakes. And in fact, you can make a tsunami in your own bathtub if you want to. Lying in the bathtub with your legs under the water, move your legs about. You move some mass inside the water, waves start to happen on the surface. Or if you're outside in your garden, sitting in your plastic swimming pool and somebody bangs the side of the pool, then you'll also find waves coming about. That's what nature does to produce tsunamis. About 80% of tsunamis are actually produced through earthquakes, large earthquakes displacing the seafloor. About 20% of tsunamis come from landslides underwater, if you like, large pieces of ocean floor just sliding down a slope. Now, the earthquakes that produce the tsunamis, for example, the ones that we saw in Sumatra, the, one, the other one we saw in Japan, um, are there caused when subduction takes place, when part of the ocean floor dives down under a continent or under another piece of ocean floor. Those two pieces of tectonic plate are pushing together very hard and an earthquake is caused when the stress of that compression is released. Every earthquake is like a spring, releasing stored up energy, but releasing that energy that may have been stored over a hundred years, releasing it in seconds or tens or hundreds of seconds. The earthquake off Japan, for example, went on for almost 100 seconds, releasing the pent-up energy that had been stored in the Earth's crust for the last 100, 150 years. When, when that happens, it's the seafloor that moves. And in fact, a tsunami is just a piece of evidence showing us that the seafloor has had an enormous displacement. In the case of the Japan earthquake, we know that seafloor, parts of the seafloor moved 40 meters further out away from Japan. Seafloor moving means that we have to be able to know the shape of the seafloor. We have to know the shape of the seafloor is changing as time goes on. As that spring is loaded, we should be able to see the seafloor deforming as it's being put under more and more compression. Now, on land, that would be easy to do. You would take some GPS satellites, you would take some GPS receivers, you would put them around on the Earth's surface, and you would see them moving relative to one another as the spring is loaded. On the seafloor, there is no GPS signal. Ocean water does not allow GPS waves to go through, and so we have to find other techniques. We use very, very precise measurements of distance on the seafloor. We use sonar buoys that send out sonar waves to each other and talk backwards and forwards with a specific time signal saying, here, it's one o'clock, and the time it takes for the sound to travel to the next beacon, it knows it's already two seconds past one, so it can work out how far away it is. If you do that for years and years and years, then you start to see these points on the seafloor moving apart. We're just beginning these experiments. We've just got the technology to begin to do this, but we're hoping by deployments of such experiments on the seafloor around the coast of the Pacific, in particular where the tsunamis are formed, that we'll be able to see uh, the springs loading, be able to do some sort of prediction of where the next tsunami could be formed. Because obviously, observing a tsunami as it happens or after it's happened is not what we want. What we'd like to do is to be able to say, here is a zone which could be tsunamogenic, as we say. This is somewhere we need to keep our eyes on. That's 80% of the tsunamis. There are another 20% caused by landslides underwater. And there are some parts of the Earth where you would say, there's never any earthquakes here. We must be quite safe from tsunamis. That's not the case. The coast of Norway experienced a huge tsunami. A massive seafloor slid down the continental slope, slid from the slope of the Norwegian continent down into the deep sea floor, causing run-up heights of up to 20 meters. That means the wave went up to 20 meters above the normal sea level, up onto Norway, covered, however, the Faroe Islands north of England. Quite a large area of the, of the North Atlantic was affected by that tsunami. If we go to look at ocean islands around the world or the margins of all the continents around the world, we see that they have experienced such landslides in the past. Now, not all landslides are going to give you a tsunami because obviously a tsunami is a relatively violent and energetic event. There are also landslides that are more or less creep. The seafloor gradually moves down. Those are not going to produce a tsunami, but if it goes all of a sudden and slips down into the deep, then that's going to generate a tsunami. We've seen those type of landslides even 
it, within human uh, memory, and even within relatively recent times, a very famous landslide was on the Grand Banks off the coast of uh, Canada, which broke a lot of transatlantic cables. We were able to then discover the speed at which that landslide was moving, and underwater it was going at several tens of kilometers an hour, sliding down the slope of the Grand Banks, ripping up the cables as it went along. These are cubic kilometers of seafloor that are underway at the same time. So tsunamis generated by movements of the seafloor. They're either spring-loaded movements revolting from earthquakes or they're sliding of the seafloor, displacing the water and causing it to move about in that bathtub. So how do we know if an earthquake is going to produce a tsunami? To produce a tsunami, the seabed has got to be moved. And in the past, it was very difficult to know whether the seabed had moved. If the seabed moves, it means the earthquake was very, very shallow. The epicenter, as we call it, was very, very shallow. With progress in technology, with progress in our knowledge of the Earth, we've been able to track those earthquakes back to their epicenter much better as time has gone on. And now we have a fairly good understanding of how deep an earthquake was. So you could have a very big earthquake, which maybe flattens lots of structures on land, which doesn't produce any tsunami. That would be an earthquake that had an epicenter that was relatively deep. You might have a less significant earthquake, a less strong earthquake that produces quite a major tsunami because it's moved the seabed quite a lot. There are also earthquakes that happen without either destroying property or causing a tsunami, and perhaps not even, they go totally unnoticed. It is possible to have slow earthquakes. The earth is capable of loading that spring and letting it go in an enormous earthquake, or loading that spring and let it gradually relax. That would be then uh, a fairly benign earthquake, if you like. 